Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Arrowhead Pharmaceuticals Conference Call. Throughout today's recorded presentation, all participants will be in a listen-only mode. After the presentation, there will be, will be an opportunity to ask questions. I will now hand the conference over to Vincent Angeloni, Vice President of Investor Relations for Arrowhead. Please go ahead, Vince. Thank you, Justin. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us today to discuss Arrowhead's results for its fiscal 2022 fiscal year ended December 30th, 2022. With us today from management, our president and CEO, Dr. Christopher Anzalone, who will provide an overview of the quarter, Dr. Javier San Martin, our chief medical officer, who will provide an update on our mid and later stage clinical pipeline, Dr. James Hamilton, our senior vice president of discovery and translational medicine, who will provide an update on our earlier stage programs, and Ken Miskowski, our Chief Financial Officer, who will give a review of the financials. In addition, Tracy Oliver, our Chief Commercial Officer, and Patrick O'Brien, our Chief Operating Officer and General Counsel, will both be available during the Q&A portion of the call. Before we begin, I would like to remind you that comments made during today's call contain certain forward-looking statements within the meaning of Section 27A of the Securities Act of 1933, and Section 21E of the Securities Exchange Act of 1934. All statements other than statements of historical fact are forward-looking statements and are subject to numerous risks and uncertainties that could cause actual results to differ materially from those expressed in any forward-looking statements. For further details concerning these risks and uncertainties, please refer to our SEC filings, including our most recent annual, annual report on Form 10-K and our quarterly reports on Form 10-Q. With that said, I'd like to turn the call over to Chris Anzalone, President and CEO of the company. Chris? Thanks, Vince. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. Uh, quickly, uh, Vince uh, excellently misspoke, and he said that our fiscal fourth quarter ended December 30th. What he meant was September 30th of 2020, uh, 2022. <laughs> uh, our fourth fiscal quarter and period since our last call has been highly productive. We've seen clear progress across, across our large and balanced pipeline large because it now includes 12 drug candidates in clinical trials, and balanced because it spans multiple therapeutic areas and includes six partner programs and six that are wholly owned. It is a good representation of that which makes us different. We are a company built on an increasingly validated technological platform applied to a large number of varied diseases across multiple organ systems where development is uncommonly rapid from idea to the patients in need, and we use targeted disciplined partnering to help finance development of our wholly owned drugs. This is who we are, and these factors are not new. What is new is the growing sense of clarity we are achieving. I think, I think, that, uh, this recurring, I think that this is a recurring theme of this update. We have increased clarity as to the makeup of our multiple phase three programs, increased clarity as to how we intend to use our late stage drug candidates in different patient populations, increased, cl cl increased clarity as to when we expect proof of concept from our earlier stage programs, increased clarity as to where we plan to go next with the expansion of our platforms into new cell types, increased clarity as to how large we think our pipeline of clinical candidates will be over the next few years, and increased clarity about how we intend to finance our growing pipeline. Let's touch on some of these. First, we expect to report on progress for Vesisaran, our AAT program partnered with Takeda in the near term. We would like to report top-line data from the Phase II Sequoia study at the same time we provide guidance on the Phase III study design. Ideally, Takeda and Arrowhead would do these together. Takeda submitted a Phase III protocol to the U.S. FDA at the end of last quarter and is waiting for feedback. We expect Takeda to receive that feedback shortly if there are any comments at all. We believe the FDA's feedback from prior meetings has been appropriately incorporated into the study design, so we do not expect any major surprises. I believe we have clarity on the future development paths and timelines, as well as what the Sequoia data are telling us, and we will share that as soon as we can. Second, we are gaining uh, a clearer understanding about how our cardiometabolic programs uh, perform in different patient populations, and thus are better able to determine the positioning of each, and importantly, the development paths and studies needed to seek approval for various indications. Javier will talk about this in a moment, but the interim analyses for the Shasta II and mirror studies of Arrow APOC3, and the ARCHES-2 study of Arrow ans 3 which we presented at AHA and at an analyst investor event shortly thereafter, 
gave us some critical insights that are helping to accelerate the path to phase three studies. We are working on determining the optimal path, and we expect to have further clarity, including from multiple anticipated regulatory interactions in 2023. At present, we plan to pursue studies to enable us to treat patients with homozygous familial hypercholesterolemia, or HOFH, and heterozygous familial hypercholesterolemia, or HEFH, with AROANS3. We hope this would enable us to pursue a staged commercial strategy whereby we could serve the small HOFH market first and grow into the HEFH market after those larger studies are complete and supplemental regulatory approval is obtained. For Aero APOC3, we are conducting studies now to enable us to treat FCS patients, followed by treating patients with severe hypertriglyceridemia, and eventually the broad population with mixed dyslipidemia. As with the HOFH to HEFH approach, we like the staged commercial strategy and hope we can serve the small FCS market rather quickly, then expand to the larger SHTG population, and eventually the even larger mixed dyslipidemia populations when those studies are complete and their respective supplemental regulatory approvals are obtained. Third, we have line of sight on timelines for initial interim clinical results for two of our pulmonary programs. James will give details on the status, but Aero Rage and Aero Muck 5AC are progressing well, and we anticipate being able to provide interim data publicly in the first half of 2023. Should we have data that provides clinical proof of concept, I think this would be a potentially big de-risking event for the candidates and for the pulmonary platform generally. We believe we've made a lot of progress with the platform since our Generation 1 candidate, Aero ENAC, and gaining clarity on how the Generation 2 candidates perform will be exciting. Importantly, we are performing various analyses to assess pharmacodynamics using different methods, so we are confident that we should be able to define knockdown and duration of effect at different dose levels and different time points. The Aero MMP7 Phase 1 started later than uh, Aero Rage and Aero Muck 5AC, but dosing in healthy volunteers should begin imminently. Fourth, our Aero C3 program continues to progress well, and we expect to have interim knockdown and safety data in the first half of 2023. This is an important program for us because A, it is squarely in our wheelhouse as an hepatocyte target, and B, because of the variety of opportunities we can pursue in various complement-mediated and complement-associated diseases. Fifth, we continue to expand our platform into new cell types and have made enough progress to give us line of sight as to when we can discuss one of them publicly. I expect to provide guidance about our next cell type and initial targets by the end of the first half of 2023. Our goal is to continually expand our platform to gain access to a new cell type every 18 to 24 months. So far, we are ahead of that goal, and you should be hearing more about the work that that has gone into the newest cell type and the encouraging preclinical results we are generating. Sixth, we have a good idea about how large we think we can grow our pipeline in the near to midterm and are announcing our 20 and 25 program. We plan to have 20 individual drug candidates in clinical trials or in the market in 2025. Between our hepatocyte-directed programs, our pulmonary programs, potential skeletal muscle-targeted programs, and new cell types, we believe we'll hit 20 in the year 2025 between wholly-owned drug candidates and partner programs. This will be a remarkable achievement that has the potential to touch millions of lives and create substantial value. Seventh, we have better clarity about our financial resources. We currently have partnerships with five different companies, and we expect to receive milestone payments from each over the next 12 months. Further, our expanding platforms give us the ability to continue to do new business development deals that could continue to provide capital to fund our own programs. Notwithstanding access to capital via these means, we recently decided to sell the potential royalties we would receive from Amgen on future old passer and sales to Royalty Pharma. We received $250 million in cash up front and up to $160 million in additional payments contingent on the achievement of certain clinical, regulatory, and sales milestones. In addition, we retained rights to $400 million in development, regulatory, and sales milestone payments potentially due from Amgen from the 2016 license agreement. We have been very impressed with the data from the program, uh, and we are confident that it has the potential to be an important medicine. However, the next step in development is a cardiovascular outcome study that will not read out for multiple years, so it made sense for us to monetize the potential stream of, of future royalties. This allows us to continue investing in our wholly owned programs 
which we think are advancing rapidly toward potential commercialization, and also continue to invest in our expanding pipeline and platform technology. Our overarching goal is to bring important medicines to patients as quickly as possible, and I believe there are two critical interrelated pieces to that. One, develop and commercialize some drugs ourselves, and two, substantially increase our market capitalization so we can do more of number one. That is the prize we need to keep our eye on, so every decision we consider should be made by asking ourselves if it gets us closer to or farther from that goal. In my mind, the decision to sell these future royalties clearly gets us closer to that goal. With that overview, I'd now like to turn the call over to Dr. Javier San Martí. Javier? Thank you, Chris, and good afternoon, everyone. I want to give updates on two main areas of our late-stage development efforts. First, on our cardiometabolic pipeline, and second, on Fasirciram, formerly called AOAT and TAC-999. Earlier this month, data was presented on all three of our cardiometabolic programs, AOA plus C3, AOA NH3, and Opacidam at the American Heart Association Scientific Sessions 2022, and at a virtual analyst and investor event that we hosted a couple days after the AHA. This was a very comprehensive review of the data and our plans for the program, so if you want to hear more from us and from external key opinion leaders in the cardiometabolic space, you can listen to a replay of the webcast or view the presentation slides. Both are available on the Arrowhead website. Today, I want to give some context about why we perform an injury analysis, highlight some of the important results, and provide guidance on where we see the progress going in the future. Chris mentioned earlier that we are gaining clarity across multiple programs, and this is a key point, especially for the cardiometabolic programs. We now have more clarity on how each of the candidates perform in various patient populations, and importantly, where we should focus late-stage development. So let me start with context on the interim analysis that led to the American Heart Association presentation. Our wholly owned cardiometabolic candidates, AROA C3, and AROH3 each target different genes and based on human genetic studies, preclinical animal model, each affect lipid and lipoprotein levels in different ways. Remember that we have data from different patient populations in the completed phase one, two studies and multiple additional clinical studies going on now for each program. For AROA C3, we have the following study. The Shasta 2 phase two study in patients with severe hypertriglyceridemia the NEUR phase two study in patients with mixed dyslipidemia, and the Palisade phase three in patients with familial calomicronemia syndrome. For AROH3, we have the following studies, the ARCH2 phase two study in patients with mixed dyslipidemia, <coughs> and the Gateway phase two in patients with homozygous familial hypercholesterolemia. We combine with the phase one data within these studies give us a good picture of how the different candidates may affect lipid and lipoprotein levels and thus, which patient populations we should focus on for each. Therefore, the interim analysis enables us to start the important work required to prepare for phase three studies. This includes dose and interval, patient population selection, length of the study, modeling to estimate event rates and effect size, registration paths and phase three designs, and where and how to execute these studies. We essentially gave ourselves a six-month head start on all that work. This is critical since we plan on having multiple end of phase two meetings and moving forward with multiple phase three studies over the next 12 months. Next, I want to highlight some of the key results from the phase two study that we presented at the American Heart Association and our webcast event. Aero A plus C3, Aero H3, and Olpacidan were all highly active at silencing their respective gene targets which resulted in encouraging changes in multiple relevant lipids and lipoprotein levels. In the Shasta II study in subject with severe hypertriglyceridemia, who had baseline triglycerides or TG greater than 500 milligrams per deciliter, treatment with AROA plus 3 at doses of 10 milligrams, 25 milligrams, and 50 milligrams, all durable decreased A plus 3 up to 87%, TGs up to 86%, non-HDL up to 45% and increased HDL cholesterol up to 99% through the week 16 time point. AROA plus 3 has been well tolerated with treatment emerging adverse events reported today that reflect the underlying comorbidities and conditions of the population under study. 
The new study in Sasha with mixed C3 trimia who had baseline average PG of 20, 20, 220 million per deciliter, non HDL of 150, LDL cholesterol of 110, and APOB of 95, Raman cholesterol at 46, and HDL cholesterol of 42 mg per deciliter. Treatment with ARO APOC3 at doses of 10 mg, 25 mg, and 50 mg resulted in substantial reduction of APOC3 of 80%, CHIS of 65%, non HDL cholesterol of 25%, LDL cholesterol of 20%, and APOB 20%. Raman cholesterol decreased by 60%, and HDL cholesterol increased by 50%. We believe these changes all represent key reduction in residual cardiovascular disease risk. In the ARCHIS-2 study in subject with mixed dyslipidemia who had baseline median TG of 226 milligrams per deciliter, treatment with aero h 3 at dose of 50 milligrams, 100 milligrams, or 200 milligrams, resulted in a substantial reduction of h 3 up to 71% at week 8, teaches up to 59% at week 16, and LDL cholesterol up to 32% at week 16. ARON3 was also associated with median relative reduction in liver fat fraction at week 24 of 28% for the 100 and 200 milligram dose, with no adverse event related to liver function test changes reported to date. ARO-NH3 has been well tolerated with treatment emerging adverse event reported today, consistent with those expected in this patient population and with associated underlying comorbidities. AMSHIN also presented enough treatment data from its Phase two Ocean A dose study of olpacidam in adults with elevated lipoprotein little a, level greater than 100, 150 nanomoles per liter, and a history of arteriosclerosis cardiovascular disease. These data were also published in the New England Journal of Medicine. Placebo adjusted mean percent reduction of LP little a were 70.5% uh, for patients receiving 10 milligrams every 12 weeks, 97.4% for patients receiving 75 milligrams every 12 weeks, 101.1% for patients receiving 225 milligrams every 12 weeks and 100.5% for patients receiving 225 milligrams every 24 weeks. The totality of these data demonstrate that significant progress achieved in RNAi drug development and specifically <coughs> which is a potential future treatment paradigm where arrowhead proprietary stream technology may be prominently leveraged in preventive cardiology. So what do we do with aeroa 3 and aeroa 3 for AOH3, we're focusing on patients with hypercholesterolemia. HPTL3 is a key regulator of lipid and lipoprotein metabolism that inhibit lipoprotein lipase and endothelial lipase. AOH3 has a unique mechanism for function to address hypercholesterolemia distinct from other LDL cholesterol lowering therapies. It may address unmet need in patients with specific genetic mutations, for example, patients with dysfunctional LDL receptors. It may also be added to other LDL cholesterol lowering therapies in patients not reaching goal. <coughs> patients with heterozygous familial hypercholesterolemia or HEFH typically have LDL cholesterol greater than 190 milligrams per deciliter and have increased risk of HSCVD. There are estimated to be around 1.4 million patients in the U.S. with HEFH. Patients with homozygous familial hypercholesterolemia, or HOFH, typically have LDL cholesterol greater than 400 milligrams per deciliter. There are around 1,200 patients with HOFH in the U.S. These are the two indications that we're focusing on initially for AROH3. Our plan is to have end of phase two meeting in the first half of 2023, and then potentially begin phase three studies in the second half of 2022. We view AROEPOC3 as having potentially broader set of indications and patient population where it might provide a benefit. It potentially addresses the risk of pancreatitis in severe hypertriglyceridemia syndrome. AROEPOC3 also modulates multiple lipids and lipoproteins that contribute to the residual risk of cardiovascular in patients with mixed dyslipidemia, which has the potential to translate into a decrease in arteriosclerosis and coronary disease progression. 
Apocytrate, the key regulator of lipid and lipoprotein metabolism that inhibit lipoprotein lipase and mediate hepatic uptake of Reman particulars in the LPL independent pathway. Aero improves multiple lipid parameters and may provide clinical benefit in a broad population with dyslipidemia. In clinical studies, it has reduced TGs in patients with severe hypertriglyceridemia, including FCS, which has the potential to decrease the risk of acute pancreatitis. It has also reduced multiple residual cardiovascular risk factors such as APOC3, LDL cholesterol, APOB, Redman cholesterol, and others in patients at risk of ASCVD. We're already conducting the PALASA phase 3 study of AROAPOC3 in patients with FCS, which is approximately 50% enrolled at this time. Our plan for the additional indication is to have regulatory interactions in the second half of 2023 and begin phase three studies in the first half of 2024. These additional indications are SHPG with a prevalence of around 4 million in the U.S. and patient at risk for ASCVD despite maximally tolerated statins with a prevalence of around 12 million in the U.S. Now I want to move on to Fasirciran, our investigational RNAi therapeutic designed to reduce production of a mutant from the alpha-1 antitrypsin protein called ZAAT. The potential treatment for the rare genetic liver disease associated with alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. ZAAT accumulation is believed to be the cause of progressive liver disease in patients with AAT deficiency. Reduction production of the pro-inflammatory CAT protein has the potential to halt the progression of liver disease and potentially allow the liver to regenerate and repair. Data from our, label, our open label phase two study were published earlier this year in the New England Journal of Medicine. Those data suggested that falciciran was very effective at reducing the production of the CAT protein and that the livers of this patient were able to begin the process of healing. This includes breaking down and clearing the accumulated CAT in the liver, decreasing the histology global burden, demonstrating histology improvement in inflammation, reducing in biomarkers of liver injury, and ultimately decreased fibrosis severity. These were very encouraging signs for the potential of fasciocinant to help patients with AATD liver disease. We now look to the Farsicinan phase 2 placebo control sequoia study and to regulatory interactions on the phase 3 study. The sequoia data are mostly in now and we're waiting to receive feedback, if any, from the FDA on the proposed design for the phase 3 study. These are expected soon, so we, are, we and our partner at Takeda will together determine the best way to communicate this publicly. Takeda is still on schedule to begin the phase three study in the first quarter of 2023, and we're confident that we can have an update publicly on Sequoia and guidance on the phase three prior to that. I will now turn the call over to Dr. James Hamilton. Thanks. Thank you, Javier. I want to give updates on, our, on four of our earlier stage programs that include three pulmonary candidates targeting RAGE, MOC5AC, and MMP7 and on our candidate targeting complement C3. Let's start with C3. Arrow C3 is an investigational RNAi therapeutic designed to reduce hepatocyte expression of complement component 3, or C3, as a potential therapy for various complement-mediated hematologic and renal diseases. We are conducting a phase 1-2 clinical study now that includes two parts. Part one is placebo-controlled in healthy volunteers and includes single ascending dose or SAD cohorts and multiple ascending dose or MAD cohorts. All of the SAD and MAD cohorts are fully enrolled and participants are being followed to assess safety and tolerability, dose response based on serum C3 levels, and duration of effect at various dose levels. We are confident that we will have sufficient data in the first half of 2023 to report interim results from part one of this study. Part two is open label in eligible subjects with paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria, or PNH, and complement mediated renal diseases, including IgA nephropathy and C3 glomerulopathy. Data from part one will inform part two dose selection 
which we expect to happen in the coming months, and then the patient cohorts will be open for enrollment in the first half of 2023. We are very excited about this program and believe it has the potential to address multiple serious complement-mediated or complement-associated diseases with unmet need in the renal and hematologic spaces. We know that complement C5 inhibitors are disease-modifying in conditions such as PNH and believe that proximal C3 inhibition may confer advantages over C5 blockade. For example, C5 monoclonal antibodies only block the terminal complement pathway, and many of the proximal complement actions remain intact. In addition, clinical validation exists for C3 inhibitors, and we believe RNAi-based C3 inhibition could have clear dosing advantages over other mechanisms. Furthermore, alternative pathway inhibition is likely of key relevance for treatment of conditions such as IgA nephropathy, C3 glomerulopathy, and potentially other glomerular diseases. AROC3 is a subcutaneously administered candidate with an expected long dosing interval of once every three months or less frequent. We think this would be much more patient-friendly than current C3 inhibitors that require a high volume infusion multiple times per week. I will now move on to our three pulmonary candidates, starting with Aero MMP7. Aero MMP7 is designed to reduce expression of matrix metalloprotein A7, or MMP7, as a potential treatment for idiopathic fibrosis, or IPF. MMP7 is thought to play multiple roles in IPF pathogenesis, including promoting inflammation and aberrant epithelial repair and fibrosis. Silencing MMP7 expression in a rat IPF model reduced inflammatory cell infiltration, limited lung fibrosis, and preserved pulmonary function. In August, we filed a CTA to begin a Phase 1-2 clinical study of Aero MMP7. The Phase 1-2 study will be similar in design to our other first-in-human studies and includes a healthy volunteer portion followed by a patient portion. Now, moving on to our two other pulmonary programs, aromuc 5 ac and AeroRage, our investigational RNAi therapeutics designed to reduce production of mucin 5 ac or muc 5 ac and the receptor for advanced glycation end products, or RAGE, respectively, as potential treatments for various mucoobstructive and inflammatory pulmonary diseases. These two programs are on largely parallel paths and at approximately the same stage. They are both in phase one, two studies designed to assess safety and tolerability, pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics in healthy volunteers first, and then in patients with asthma. For both programs, we are approaching full enrollment of the healthy volunteer SAD cohorts and are well into enrollment of the healthy volunteer MAD cohorts. In both the SAD and MAD, we have various methods to assess target engagement, including in induced sputum, and bronchiovular lavage fluid, and for RAGE, we are also measuring serum S-RAGE protein, a circulating biomarker for RAGE target engagement in the lung. We anticipate that we will be able to report interim results from phase from part one of these studies and begin part two in patients with asthma in the first half of 2023. These are potentially important new medicines that address targets that have been difficult to drug with other modalities and are designed to treat mucoobstructive and inflammatory lung diseases in fundamentally new ways. We are excited to see and share these results, and we are confident in the progress we've made on our pulmonary trim platform and these, two, and these generation two candidates. I will now turn the call over to Ken Miskowski. Ken? Thank you, James, and good afternoon, everyone. As we reported today, our net loss for fiscal 2022 was $176.1 million, or $1.67 per share, based on 105.4 million fully diluted weighted average shares outstanding. This compares to the net loss of $140.9 million, or $1.36 per share, based on 103.7 million fully diluted weighted average shares outstanding for 2021. Revenue for fiscal 22 was $243.2 million compared to $138.3 million for 2021. Revenue in the current period primarily relates to our collaboration agreements with Takeda and Horizon. 
Revenue will be recognized as we complete our performance obligations, which includes managing the ongoing AAT Phase 2 clinical trials for Takeda and delivering a Phase 1 ready candidate to Horizon. There remains $128.4 million of revenue to be recognized associated with the Takeda collaboration, which we anticipate will be recognized over the next two to three years. And there remains $6.7 million of revenue to be recognized for Horizon, which we anticipate will be recognized. Please remain on the line. Your conference will resume shortly. And please remain online. Your conference will resume shortly. Please remain on the line. Your conference will resume shortly. Please remain on the line. Your conference will resume shortly. All right, folks, we had a connection problem there. I'll continue about halfway through our my prepared remarks. Net cash used by operating activities during fiscal 2022 was $136.1 million, compared with net cash provided by operating activities of $171.2 million during 2021. The increase in cash used by operating activities 
is driven primarily by research and development expenses. We expect our operating cash burn to be 70 to $90 million per quarter in fiscal 2023, and we expect capital expenditures up to $200 million as we near completion on our footprint expansion projects, including GMP manufacturing. <clears throat> Turning to our balance sheet, our cash and investments totaled $482.3 million at September 30, 2022, compared with $613.4 million at September 30, 2021. The decrease in our cash and investments was primarily due to cash use for operating activities. Our common shares outstanding at September 30, 2022 were $106.0 million. As Chris mentioned earlier, on November 9, 2022, the company and Royalty Pharma entered into a royalty purchase agreement, pursuant to which Royalty Pharma agreed to pay up to $410 million in cash to the company in consideration for the company's future royalty interest in El Pasaran, originally developed by the company and out licensed to Amgen in 2016. Pursuant to the Royalty Pharma agreement, Royalty Pharma paid $250 million upfront and agreed to pay an additional, up to an additional $160 million contingent upon the achievement of certain clinical, regulatory, and sales milestones. The company retained rights to $400 million in development, regulatory, and sales milestones payment, sales milestone payments potentially due from Amgen from the same 2016 outlicensing agreement. Pro forma cash and investments at September 30, 2022 including the Royal Pharma cash receipt, would be $732.3 million. I will now turn the call back to Chris. <clears throat> Thanks, Ken. In our business, opportunity abounds. There is no shortage of need that the biopharmaceutical industry can endeavor to serve and no shortage of lives that can be touched. There is also no shortage of risk, as unknowns abound. As such, clarity is at a premium, and will often be a primary value driver. We feel good about the clarity we have recently achieved and expect to achieve in the short term. These include the following. Planning for busy Saran's uh, phase three is complete and currently under review with the FDA and Sequoia data are in. We expect to be able to give guidance on the phase three and present top, top line Sequoia data with Takeda shortly. Interim phase two data from Aero Ange 3 and Aero APOC 3 suggest that both drug candidates are doing what they are designed to do, and we have good plans as to how to, to apply these in various patient populations. We expect multiple end of phase two meetings in 2023 and to initiate multiple phase three studies shortly thereafter. Progress with Aero Muck 5 ac and Aero Rage in phase one, two studies has been good. We expect interim data that could provide clinical proof of concept in the first half of 2023. Aero C3 is progressing well in a phase one, two study, and we expect interim data that could provide proof of concept in the first half of 2023. Our discovery engine continues to perform, and we expect to announce the next cell type we will be targeting in the first half of 2023. We have provided better clarity with respect to our balance sheet with our saleable pass around royalty rights for $250 million upfront plus $160 million potential additional payments. This is on top of the remaining $400 million we could access in clinical, regulatory, and sales milestone payments from Amgen. And finally, we have announced our 20 and 25 campaign. Our plan of having 20 individual drugs in clinical trials or ad market in 2025 will be a remarkable accomplishment that we believe will represent a large leap forward for medicine and position Arrowhead as a truly unique and impactful biopharmaceutical company. Thank you for joining us today, and I would now like to turn the call over to questions. Operator? And thank you. As a reminder, to ask a question, you'll need to press star 1-1 on your telephone. We ask that you limit yourself to one question and one follow-up. Please stand by while we compile the Q&A roster. And one moment for our first question. In one moment for our first question, and our first question comes from Maury Raycroft from Jeffries. Your line is now open. Hi, um, thanks for taking my questions. I'm just going to ask one on uh, AAT. 
Wondering if you can clarify if you or Takeda has shared the phase two biopsy data with FDA and if their feedback will be based on the, the biopsy data or only the serum biomarker data, uh, knockdown data. Okay. Yeah, and, um, the feedback that we're looking is at the phase three protocol design that was already discussed twice. And as Chris said, we already, Takeda already incorporated most of the feedback. So this is more a procedure than anything else. And the Sequoia data is not part of this um, feedback that we're looking for. In other words, the sequoia data that was necessary to inform the phase three was already presented and is part of the discussion that we've been having with the agency over the last uh, four or five months. Got it. Okay. Okay. And then um, for the AAT data that you have in hand, can you comment on, on what you're seeing and better set expectations for what you will disclose? And if you start the phase three in the first quarter of next year, do you think the update will happen in December or more likely around JP Morgan meeting in early January? Yeah, I, I can't give too granular guidance on the on the timing for the update, but I'll tell you, my hope is that we is that we can do that in December. We just have to to see what schedules look like. You know, we expect the feedback, if any, from from FDA um, uh, almost any day now. Um, and so, so we, 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 we do have time to get that in in December. And so, so we'll see. With respect to, to giving further guidance on the, on the square data, you know, we're just not going to do that. Um, you know, we will, um, you know, provide that update, um, at the same time as we, as we, um, um, as we give guidance on what the phase three will look like. Okay. Sounds good. I'll hop back in the queue. Thanks for taking my questions. Thank you. And thank you. In one moment for our next question. And our next question comes from Luca Izzy from RBC Capital. Your line is now open. Oh, great. Uh, thanks so much for taking my question. Congrats on the progress. I have a quick one on APO versus ANG. Uh, it looks to me that you're prioritizing APO C3 over ANG3, especially for the larger mixed dyslipidemia population. Uh, I can expand a little bit more on the rationale behind the decision. And is it fair to assume that you're looking for a partner for APOC3, given that you need to run a cardiovascular outcome trial? Thanks so much. Um, I'll take the second part, and then I'll, I'll hand the first part over to, to Javier. Um, the answer is no, we are not looking for a partner for APOC3. Now that, that to us feels like uh, 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 an important opportunity for us. The, the data have been, from our perspective, uh, unequivocal, um, uh, and we see a large opportunity in, the, in, in large markets as well as smaller SHTG market and, of course, the very small FCS market. So we like the opportunity, and, and we intend to conduct um, uh, that cardiovascular outcome study ourselves and to, and to commercialize that drug ourselves. Yeah. So a um, couple of things. So first, the phase two data or the interim data that we presented at the American Heart Association really confirmed what we learned in the phase one, two studies. So um, it wasn't about prioritization. It was about to really learn and confirm the specific therapeutic effect of these two molecules. And we, as we said before, ANGE seems to be a drug that is more focused on hypercholesterolemia, and that is how we see the opportunity. Now, that's a much crowded space when you think about the general hypercholesterolemia population, but this drug has a very unique pathway and mechanism of function that can address this specific a smaller population that the rare HOFH and the not so rare HEFH. So it's not about prioritization, but it's about where the profile of this drug fits in the context of clinical care, particularly when you fast forward a few years from now. So ero 3 as you saw, the, the data that we knew about the severe hypertriglyceridemia populations is confirmed. And it's very remarkable and it's consistent. And as I always say, with these therapeutics, we have a 100% response with regard to hypertriglyceridemia. So our initial plan to go with the two severe hypertriglyceridemia syndrome, the FCS or the SSG, continue to be the same. What we are learning, and I think that was a key feature of our analyst and investor day, is what is the medical need in cardiovascular risk reduction in the next five to 10 years? And we believe that the LDL cholesterol issue is probably well taken care of, and the rest of the risk comes from different 
sources of lipid and lipoprotein, most of which are addressed with the ARO APOC3 molecule. So, so the, in conclusion, we see the opportunity where the unmet medical need is, and ARO APOC3 fit very well those criteria. So it's not about prioritization, but it's really going to where the drugs um, have the biggest promise. Yeah, I, I, uh, look, I, I, I think that our development programs work exactly as we, as we design them to work. Um, you know, we had these, these two drug candidates that were clearly active uh, and, and clearly had some overlap in their activity. Uh, and people would ask how we're going to apply these, these two drugs to various patient populations. And our answer always was, we need to look at the data and that will, that will guide us. Um, that was not a satisfactory answer to some people, but that was the answer. Uh, and now that we have an interim look, we've got a better idea about, about how these will, will, uh, um, will help various patient populations. And so now I think we've got a good idea. And again, as, as, as Javier said, we don't view this as prioritizing. We view this as just following where these drugs are going to have their, 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 uh, their greatest benefit in which patients. Great. I'll hop back in the queue. Thank you. And thank you. And one moment for our next question. And our next question comes from Ellie Merrill from UBS. Your line is now open. Hey, hey guys, thanks so much for taking the question. Uh, for the initial pulmonary readout uh, in the first half of next year, I guess, what are you looking to see in terms of the degree of protein knockdown based on the dose levels that you're studying uh, in healthy volunteers? And I guess, when you think about pulmonary delivery, I guess, what does proof of concept um, for the pulmonary platform look like um, from this readout, or if perhaps we need to wait for uh, longer-term data? Thanks. Sure. Look, I, I think these are well-validated targets, um, uh, in particular, you know, particularly much by the AC, um, but I think even RAGE and certainly MMP7. Uh, and so, so our thinking is that if we can see a well-tolerated, you know, deep knockdown um, in healthy volunteers, that is a that is a substantial um, uh, clinical proof of concept. Um, we will, we will also have some data, you know, later in the year on uh, uh, in various patient populations. But I think I think if we can see good consistent knockdown in healthy volunteers that's well-tolerated, I think that's a that is. Uh, a giant leap forward for the entire platform and certainly for the individual candidates. With respect to how much knockdown we need, you know, I don't think we're setting, I don't think we're setting expectations for ourselves here. I think we want to see what we see. Um, uh, but our, 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 our hope is that we see consistent, um, and at least relatively deep, deep knockdown. Um, and, and if we can, I think that, that given the importance of these targets, uh, I think that they will have disease modifying effects. Great. Thanks. You're welcome. Thank you. And one moment for our next question. And our next question comes from Joel Beatty from Baird. Your line, line is now open. Thanks. For the lung programs, MUX 5AC and RAGE, um, I, I think in a pair, pair of remarks you mentioned that both of these programs are going to be from the top of their um, SAD cohorts and, and also flowing MAD cohorts. How, how do you decide the, the peak dosing of those? Are, are, is it in this kind of preset or are you looking at safety or efficacy markers? Yeah, so the, the dose levels uh, for the, the SAD and MAD are, uh, are largely preset. And then uh, as we go from one dose level to the next, we have an independent data safety committee that reviews aggregate safety data and votes to allow dose escalation from the dose just completed to the next higher dose. Hopefully that addresses your question. Great. Thanks. Yes. And then for the cardio drugs, FOC3 and ANG3, um, do you see the market opportunity as more um, of displacing current drugs and being used in place of them or as add-on therapies to the current set of drugs in the market? You know, uh, I think it's a little bit too early uh, to, op to to opine on that. It's a, it's a broad question. Um, uh, give us some more give us some more time so we can complete the phase two and we, we have a better idea about what that looks like and we can go from there. But at, at this point, uh, I don't think that we we want to get into how we slot into various um, uh, therapeutic paradigms. 
Great. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. And one moment for our next question. And our next question comes from Edward Tenthoff from Piper Sandler. Your line is now open. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, two questions, if I may. Um, <clears throat> just um, housekeeping, what was the uh, fourth quarter weighted um, average shares outstanding, if you have them, to uh, three decimal points? But then for Chris, kind of level question, you know, you guys have been so successful at partnering um, different therapies. You've been clear that cardiovascular is a key area of focus. How are you really looking at the pipeline going forward? Like, is pulmonary disease going to be an area, a uh, second area of focus? Um, you know, are you going to look to partner some of those therapies? How should we be thinking about sort of where you guys are going to stay focused and specialized? Thanks. Sure. Thanks. Uh, Ken, you want to address the first question? Um, yes. <laughs> Thanks, Ken. I know I always, I always ask you this. Yeah, the weighted average shares for the Q4 were 105,879. Awesome. Thank you. And then, again, just in terms of higher level, obviously, focus on cardiovascular disease. What else are you guys thinking about partnering, or what is going to be core? Sure. Uh, thanks, thanks, Bud. So, so broadly, of course, that's that's a dynamic question, um, you know, because as the company grows and and as as you know, market um, uh, appetites you know, for various targets and drugs uh, you know change, of course, you know that which can be partnered changes. Having said all of that, look, we as we said in the past, we like cardiovascular. We we like. We like um, what we're seeing with ABLE C3 and N3. We like the idea of building commercial force, you know, to address those. We like the stage approach there of starting with HOFH and, and, and expanding into AGFH. We like the idea of starting with small FCS, expanding into FACC, and then expanding into mixosipidemia. Now, with regard to, to pulmonary, look, that's, that's a very interesting area. You know, we think that's a target-rich environment. You know that that feels to us like another liver, um, uh, and 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 we think you know look there, we can address that 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 market. You know I think there are 16 yeah. or so thousand pulmonologists in the U.S. Uh, and and we we see not you know two or three or four drugs, but eight or nine or ten drugs. So so I think that we will play there. Now because it's so target rich, I think we also could do some partnerships there at some point. Sure. We're not looking to partner these first three right now. Um, but I think there's room there for us to build a real franchise, and then also to you know, to work with the right companies um, um, on on a handful of uh, of other uh, targets potentially. Um, and then you look at, at our other candidates, you know, C3. You know, that's a very interesting uh, uh, drug candidate uh, to hold on to ourselves. That that gives us an awful lot of optionality in terms of how we commercialize that, where we go, how fast you know we can get there. Um, so, anyway, that's sort of a a broad answer to your question, I guess. All right. Well, stay tuned. And uh, just hats off on the um, royalty financing. That's a great deal. Thank you. Thank you. And one moment for our next question. And our next question comes from Patrick Truzio from H.C. Wainwright. Your line is now open. Thanks. Um, <clears throat> good evening. I'm, I'm just wondering, I have a follow-up just on the, on the platform, and if you can discuss the relative advantages of, of the siRNA approach as it compares to others, such as small molecules or gene editing, specifically in the area of alpha-1, though also more broadly across the pipeline, what is your level of confidence that siRNA will be the preferred mechanism in these various targets and indications in the programs currently underway, particularly as these other modalities advance in clinical development? Uh, sure. So, so look, that, that's a little bit of a hard question to answer broadly because because you know various drug candidates will have will have you know will have specific advantages. But I'll tell you I'll tell you broadly the way we look at this. Um, you know, RNAi is not is not the right modality for every indication, of course. Um, but but for for many indications where where you really where you need to to reduce the expression of some gene product, it's a good one. Um, I think we've shown. We and others have shown time and time again that RNAi appears to be 
um, a potentially better modality than, than antisense oligos in terms of, of dosing schedule, in terms of, of uh, depth of knockdown, in terms of safety. Uh, we think that will continue, at least as it relates to, to, uh, to hepatocyte targets, and we'll see if, if that applies uh, more broadly. Um, when you look at gene editing, look, I think that's an interesting idea. Uh, I think that, that, that we're not quite ready for prime time there, and I think that there is a, a permanence associated with gene editing that, that may be um, – that, that may cause some some pause, you know, with with uh, at least for certain indications. Um, what's great about RNAi is that we get a good, long, durable uh, effect, uh, but yet it is ultimately reversible. You know, after after some period of time, um, you know, that that drug wears off and it doesn't knock down the gene product any longer. What would concern me, uh, at least in the near to midterm, um, with the gene editing um, approach is that is that. Uh, you know, the idea of, ha- of, of, of having to uncrisperize something is a daunting one. Uh, and so I think it's still a bit of an early technology. Uh, but, but at least as, as relates to the indications we're going after, we, we believe that, that RNAi, uh, at least in our current pipeline, is, is, is likely the, and from my perspective at least, the, the, um, the preferred modality. Yeah, that, that's helpful. And then earlier in the call, there's commentary around increased clarity on which programs and how large the pipeline could become in the next few years with the goals outlined through 2025. So I'm wondering if you can elaborate a bit more on this commentary, particularly regarding gating factors involved in deciding which targets or disease to pursue, such as the level of genetic or clinical validation required, and how many programs, either in terms of new INDs or some other metric, would you be expected to announce on an annual basis going forward as you expand the pipeline? Well, yeah, so we're excited about the, about our 20 and 25 uh, uh, program. We feel comfortable that we'll get there. Um, I think 20 clinical uh, candidates, uh, um, whether wholly owned or, or partnered, um, is a is a lofty goal, and I think we're going to achieve it. Um, um, uh, regarding regarding genetically validated targets and such, you know, if you go down our pipeline, um, I think that that there is pretty good consensus that that these are all well validated targets, with the possible exception of HPV, just because it's a complicated a virus, of course, but everything else, I think clearly there is consensus among KOLs that if you can reduce expression of, of these various targets, you know, positive phenotypes will result. And, and I, and I, and, and our goal is to continue with that. Second, uh, if you look down our pipeline, everything we've gone after, we've been the first RNAi player there. I, I'd like to continue that, at least in the near term, I think we will be continuing that. And then finally, you know, with respect to our ability to get outside the liver, you know, as we talked about with pulmonary, with skeletal muscle, um, we'll be we'll be you know announcing our next cell type you know, in the first half of next year. With all of these, it gives us it gives us the ability to to run out and and um, and and take land, right? You know, the, we, we don't see any near term competitors in these in these uh, extra paddock spaces, at least so far. Uh, and so it gives us the ability to really be choosy and 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 uh, and go after targets that are well validated well validated to decrease our biology risk. Thank you very much. Sure. Thank you. And one moment for our next question. And our next question comes from Madhu Kumar from Goldman Sachs. Your line is now open. Oh, hey, thanks for taking our question. So maybe following up on Ellie's question, what do you think is the dynamic range of rage and muxate 5AC knockdown that would be predictive of clinical benefit? in these obstructive pulmonary conditions? Yeah, so um, for RAGE, I would say based on our animal data, you know, we were um, in the uh, the alternaria model that we presented at, um, at ATS, we were wanting to get better than 50% knockdown, you know, 60 to 70% knockdown in that particular animal model. Um, and then for for Muxay AC, you know, I think if you look at the um, the patient data versus the healthy volunteer expression level for uh, for Muc5 AC, the patients have maybe tenfold more um, Muc5 AC compared to uh, to what the healthies have. So uh, I think that now you probably don't have to bring the patients back to normal levels to have a benefit, um, but particularly in the patients, I think there's pretty 
significant dynamic range in terms of month by base seed knockdown, uh, such that, you know, if you get 50% reduction in uh, month by base seed expression, you may see a, an associated clinical benefit. I don't know if that addresses your question. No, that's helpful. Oh, no. Maybe on, on AAT, I guess kind of how much different would you expect the Sequoia data to be from the phase two open label extension, given kind of like patient recruitment in Sequoia relative to the open label extension? Like, is there any reason for there to be a significant difference in kind of the disease course in the Sequoia patients relative to the open label extension? Uh, I don't. I don't believe so. No, with, they, they should be similar. Um, you know, look, we we. We always viewed the, that open label data as as important uh, in terms of, of of pegging a story. It was a small you know number of, of patients, but we thought it it, it 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 pegged the story. And and we have been looking for we've been hoping that, that Sequoia would confirm that story. Okay, great. Thank you very much. You're welcome. And thank you. And one moment for our next question. And our next question comes from Mayank Montani from B. Riley. Your line is now open. Uh, hi, good afternoon. Thanks for squeezing me in and appreciate you putting out the 2025 uh, campaign. So maybe on uh, the Shasta study, quick, quick follow-up on the, you know, two pancreatic events that you saw there, you know, admittedly in a blinded manner. But is that what you would expect for a study, in, you know, this size and, uh, and in general, like, what would be the event rate for a, you know, SSTG study and, and maybe a, a second part, you know, as you think about validating triglyceride as a approvable endpoint for either SSTG or, or for larger mixed dyslipidemia indication, how, how are you sort of thinking about that next year? Yeah, so with regard to the two cases of pancreatitis are well within the expected event rates, which is about 3 to 5% per year in this patient population. So we saw two cases in about 200 patients, and by the time we, I mean, by now we have, you know, almost one year follow-up in most of those patients. So, yes, the event rate is, you know, what we expected. And the second part with regard to the to the phase 3 study I think we commented on this before, uh, the registration program for AOA positive in the severe hypertriglyceridemia indication does not need a pancreatitis endpoint for approval, but of course we would like to enrich the patient population as much as possible to do provide information about pancreatitis risk reduction, which is the goal of therapy, and that would be very important for many other reasons. Uh, really to, to, to translate the clinical benefit, um, to define the value propositions and, and so forth. So the, the approval path does not require pancreatitis, but we will do our best to have enough number of patients at high risk so we can see the risk reduction in pancreatitis as a consequence of normalizing triglycerides level. Um, th th thank you. And, and then just a quick one on uh, A180. Um, are, are you able to comment on how, you know, as you think about phase three, w w how are you thinking about placebo response? Because, you know, there have been studies recently put out, uh, you know, independent of this program and also by Takeda, uh, uh, you know, about how to sort of think about F2, F3 patients differently. Um, so is, is there anything you could comment on that, uh, on, on the placebo response for phase three, how you might be thinking about it? So we're, we're going to use the totality of the data available to estimate the placebo rate, and that will be part of the equation for the effect size and the power um, for that study. So you will see that in detail whenever we can do this, <coughs> this event with Takeda and present the Sequoia data and the phase three study design. So we, of course, use the totality of the data to uh, plan for that study. Thanks for taking our questions. And thank you. And one moment for our next question. And our next question comes from Kay Nakai from Chardon. Your line is now open. Uh, yes, thanks, uh, Chris. Um, one question on AATD, the, the phase three design. 
is it your expectation that um, the agency will or will not require paired biopsy data? Yes, yeah, so um, the biopsy data is likely to be the, the key endpoint. That's what we will were thinking. That's what we study. That's what the disease is defined by. So this is a disease about fibrosis progression that and, and ended in end-stage liver disease or cirrhosis. So the goal of therapy is to prevent uh, fibrosis progression or to reduce uh, fibrosis severity. So that seems to me a logical approvable endpoint in a condition that is defined by fibrosis progression. Okay, thanks. Thank you. And one moment for our next question. And our next question comes from Manny Foar from SBB. Your line is now open. Hey guys, thanks for taking the question and congrats on all the progress. Um, I've, got a, I've got a couple of questions more about your own sort of rationale and strategy, um, given a lot of other analysts have dug into the details of, of this or that specific program. So I'll start with Sequoia. Did I hear right that, you know, that your plan is to disclose the upcoming Sequoia data green biopsy alongside the phase three trial design? Um, and if so, could, I, uh, could you give me a sense of the rationale of why those two should come out at the same time? And then secondarily, um, there's been a few people who've asked about your strategy around running CDOTs, which assets to hold on to or not. Um, could you give me a sense of what your ballpark estimate around the size, cost, and the operational burden of a CDOT would be for you and how you guys think about the number of studies of that scale that you could run for your assets simultaneously? Uh, sure. So, the, so the, the first question is going to kind of, I've got more more uh, on the first question than the second question. Um, so the so look um, the um, um, having a complete data set for Sequoia um, and having uh, having clarity on what the phase three look like looks like uh, just happened to come out at around the same time, and so it made sense for us to to present both of those at the same time. Um, um, you know. And I think I think they you know they're both related, of course, and they feed on each other. Of course, if there was a big time you know delta between the two, we would have been happy to to, to separate those. But it just turns out that that uh, that again, the SCOI data are are analyzed, and and we expect to have you know final clarity on the phase three data at about the same time. So so it makes sense you know to do those together, and we'd like to do them you know in conjunction with the CADA. That makes sense as well. Um, you know we'll just we'll just you know see when when uh, when the, when the calendars will align for that. Um, with respect to the CVAT, look, we haven't given any guidance um, on, on, on how large, you know, a study would be on how much it would cost yet, um, in large part because we haven't had those, you know, end-of-phase two meetings with the FDA. We, we, we really want to start to have these discussions before we opine on that because there are, there are several ways you can do a CVAT, of course, um, and it, it just feels a little bit early to, to opine on that. We will give guidance on that once we have it, um, but we just, you know, we're still pretty early here. You know, we've got an interim look. We have a pretty good idea about what the data we think are telling us. Um, um, and then, you know, we, 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 still, we still are going to run these, these studies out to the end and, and then have end of phase two uh, meetings. And so I expect that next year sometime we can give you better guidance or some guidance on, on size, cost, uh, et cetera, for the CVOT. Hey, thanks, guys. Can I ask one quick follow-up on that second half of that question? Um, sure. uh, for HEFH in particular, um, how do you think about the appropriate patient population to study? There are a number of approved therapies out there, P59 targeting and otherwise, um, but the universe of available therapies varies pretty wildly across geographies, um, not just with approval, in terms of actual availability to patients, given reimbursement, et cetera, um, and real-life barriers. Um, so how do you think about the strategy between pursuing a study focused in areas where patients don't really have access to approved therapies versus a study in add-on with approved therapies to allow you to access the U.S. and Western European market with more real-world relevant data? Like, how do you balance those two? Would you do two CBOTs? Would you do two HGFH studies? 
there's so many capture the two in one larger multi-arm study. Just tell me, think about how you strategize and think about the likely outcomes for that path forward in that indication. Yeah, again, this will be an unsatisfying answer to you, and I apologize. But 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 until we start to have these interactions with the regulators, it's it's hard it's hard for us to you know to you know to know what um, it's hard for us to give you a good answer on that. Um, you know, again, keep in mind that we're still we still haven't finished that study yet. Um, we wanted to to tell the street as quickly as we could where we where we think we can apply these two drugs. I think we've done that, um, um, but we're we're not yet ready to talk about about how we would roll this out, where we would roll this out, what sorts of studies um, would support these kind of uh, these sort of populations until we start to have those interactions. Great. I look forward to more detail um, then. Thanks, guys. Yep. Yep. And thank you. And I am showing no further questions. I would now like to turn the call back over to Chris Angeloni for closing remarks. Uh, thanks, everyone, for joining us today. I hope everyone had a, a pleasant uh, Thanksgiving holiday and, and uh, have a nice larger holiday season. I apologize for the technical difficulties uh, mid-call today, um, but we will talk to you soon. This concludes today's conference call. Thank you for participating. You may now disconnect.